at Luke 21, listen to verse 29. And he spoke to them in a parable. And, and I'll talk about that in a moment. He says, look at the fig tree, that's Israel, and all the trees. When, you, when they have already are budding, you see and know for yourselves that the summer is now here. How many of you know that's a season change? It's a change. Ecclesiastic says God changes times and seasons. It's not man to change the seasons. God changes times and seasons. And he says the season has changed. So you also know when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation by no means shall pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. That's what you see in the natural. That's not the third heaven, the kingdom of, of our God, but that's referring to this place. Heaven and earth will pass away. The second heaven's referring to also, but my words by no means will pass away. Then he says these words, take heed that you do not deceive yourselves. Lift your hearts get weighed down with the carousingness, the drunkenness, the cares of this life, that the day come upon you unexpectedly. What day is that, Joey? The day of the Lord's return, the rapture of the church. For it will come as a snare to all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape the things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of God. I want to talk to you about a simple message, but we're going to cover a lot of ground. So as you sit down, buckle up your seatbelt, take your nitroglycerin tablet, get ready, because we're going to discuss some things that's going to shock some of you, but prepare you for the coming of our Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for the word. Thank you today. It's going on good hearts, good ears, good soils, receptive to what you want to do. And the Spirit say, prepare the church, prepare us to be ready for the return of the Son of the King. In Jesus' name, and all God's men and women said, amen. amen. You could be seated in the house. Thank you so much, Ren. I want you to think about this because a parable is a parallel. When you think of the word parable, it's a timeless story that is injecting another way in which to approach something. So if you think of the word, now look at me this morning. If you think of the word parable, think of it as a parallel. It's a linear thing that's happening. In other words, if I have a, a, a thing happening over here and you're here, you can't see what's happening here, even though they might be happening at the same time. So this parable is a parallel story of something that is happening in the world. Jesus is telling us something that's happening, and he says, in this parable, parallel, when you look at the fig tree, fig tree is Israel, October 7th, this Year, last year, Israel was attacked. Over 1,200 people were slaughtered. You say, what's new about that? Well, it ushered into, in the human history, there's never been a barrage of missiles that happened last week from Iran that launched into Israel. Those are ballistic missiles. In the history of mankind, there has never been that many ballistic missiles launched. Who was it launched by? No longer by a proxy war of Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, or, or the Houthi rebels, or, 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 or any other ISIS, or none of those uh, affiliations of the, of the enemies. This was a direct attack from a nation to another nation. What you're seeing is a collaboration of the end that is coming. The end of what? A dispensation. And what you need to understand of this parable that Jesus is talking about, it's like a parallel. It's like giving you an understanding on another playing field of what's happening. But most Christians get overwhelmed. God said it himself in his word by the Issues by the cares of the world, by their own parable they're living in, their own parallel life. They're living in this time and they're going, what's happening? What's going on? Focused on this thing, focused on that thing. What's going to happen in our world? And Jesus is telling us what's going to happen. He's telling us that these things are coming, and ladies and gentlemen, they're already here. The things I preached about 25, 27 years ago, these things that I'd preach about and people would say, yeah, we know it's coming. It's here. It's here right now, and the church shouldn't be shook up. It should be looking up for the redemption draw off near. It's coming. But most Christians think of it like, ah, it's far off. It's far off. Jesus said, my words will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but no mean my words shall not pass away. So 
ask, ask yourself this. Many people don't believe in the return of the Lord that they have to go through something to get to something. But I'm telling you this, the next prophetic message for God's children is the rapture. I believe that with everything in me. It's the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is no more escapism, as some would teach, than you escape hell and the death of hell by receiving Christ as your Savior and Lord. It's no more escapism than you becoming a Christian and escaping the eternal damnation of hell, living without God for eternity. So I say that to give you an opportunity to understand where we are on this parallel timeline so you can understand it. So will there be a rapture? These two pastors were having a conversation, and they were talking about post-rapture, pre-rapture, or are we going to come in the time of this tribulation or great tribulation? And so one of the pastors, he was Baptist, he says, uh, I don't know what, when the rapture is going to come, and I, I, I think we're going to go pretty soon. And, and, the, and, the, and the Presbyterian pastor says, no, 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 I, our church is going first. And the Baptist pastor said, why do you think your Presbyterian church, church is going first in the rapture? Because... The dead in Christ shall rise first. See, some churches are so dead, if you shake their hand, you might have your hand embalmed before you get to the seat. We're living in a time where God's children need to wake up and stir up because they're getting ready to go up. I'm telling you that for a reason. The children of God need to be the most excited, the most happy, the most thrilled because this book is coming to pass. It's coming to pass. One guy had an operation at the local hospital, and uh, he was a casual Christian. I'll just call him Bob, Bob Smith. He was casual in his Christianity, and he had an operation. And when he woke up from the anesthesia, all the, the curtains were pulled, and it was dark in his room. And as he awoke, and he said, why, why, are the, why, are the, why are the shades drawn? And the nurse said, well, there's a, there's a house across the street on fire. We didn't want you to wake up and, and th think you were in the wrong place. I watched a pastor on, uh, you know, social media, and he said, he was, he was an African pastor, and he says, if, 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 if you do not see me after you die, you have went to hell. <laughs> That's pretty good. It's meaning, if you die and you don't see me, you're in hell, meaning he's in heaven. I think I should start my sermons like that. Listen, if you die and you do not see me with you, that means you've gone to hell. But I want you to think about this for a moment because we're living in a time where hysteria is setting in with fake news, misinformation, disinformation. And it comes to this point right here as Christians. We have to know what we know and know in that which we believe and why we believe it. We have to have a core value instead of just shared interests. People ask, well, what's the difference, Joey, whether I believe in the rapture of the church or not? Exactly this. The Bible says to those who look for him, to him will he appear a second time to. Hebrews 9, 28. To those that look for him, to him he will appear appear to a second time to. If you're not looking for him, he's not appearing to you. Many Christians don't realize because they're not looking for him to interject themselves in their own parable. He's, they're not looking for him to come through in the way that there, where there seems to be no way. They're not looking for him to come through when the doctor says it's terminal and God says, no, it's temporary because I'm the healer of the broken body. I'm the healer of the upset, troubled mind. I'm the healer of the overwhelmed because of the cares of this world. If you're not looking for the Son of God to return, he's not coming for you. So so let's be looking for the Lord to come in every area of our life. The Bible says, watch therefore and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming upon this earth. Where there be a rapture, listen to the Apostle Paul tell us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. He said, the Lord himself, say it with me, the Lord himself will descend with a shout and the voice of the archangels will split the heaven and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds 
clouds to meet him in the air. Matthew 24 verse 30 follows. And there shall appear a sign in the Son of Man in heaven. And you shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. How about Acts 111? It records it this way. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus. Let's say it together. This same Jesus shall come in like manner as you've seen him go. In other words, you've seen him go physically, you've seen him go visibly, you've seen him go literally. Therefore, when he comes back to this earth, he's coming back literally, physically, and visibly. We will see him in the clouds of glory when he comes to the earth. You put those Bible pictures together, folks, and you have this concept. Jesus Christ, the crown prince of glory, very soon is going to come and appear in the clouds of heaven, suddenly in all of his glorious radiance. The Bible says as lightning flashes east to the west, so shall it be for the coming of the Son of Man. In meteorological science, when lightning flashes east to the west, it's nature's sign that the storm is over. I'm telling you, when Christ comes back, the storm will be over, and it will be over forever. Jesus is going to appear in the clouds, and the trump of God shall sound. Why the trumpet, you may ask? Because that's the Bible's way of announcing royalty, and Christ is royalty. I'm tired of people thinking that Christ's name should be used as a curse word. It's not to be used in a curse word. Jesus Christ is lovely. He is awesome. He is mighty. There's no God like our God. He's royalty. He's He's the Prince of Peace. He's the King of all kings, and He's the Lord of all lords. He's the one who's mighty in battle. The voice of the archangel shall summon the righteous. I'm telling you that because when the rapture takes place, dead men will come back to life. From the graves they shall be summoned to meet the Master. All over the earth, graves will explode. Imagine this in the theater of your mind. Occupants begin to soar into the heavens. The dusty grave clothes have been shaken off. Marble mausoleums will topple over the body of the resurrected saints of God begin to rise to meet the Lord in the air cars will be parked beside the freeway supper dishes will be left on the table because the occupants have gone gone to mansions on high homes of believers as they're sitting around a supper table suddenly and unexpectedly will be taken away to meet the marriage supper of the lamb the once and for all glory has come the Lord has returned headlines will be screaming all over the world. Millions, perhaps billions of people are missing without a trace. Unfortunately, those who have not come to know the Lord, they're left behind. Now they're going to suffer through the hell of the tribulation. Television cameras will go all over cemeteries around the world, and they will show what some may see already in movies and certain things they watch, empty graves, ruptured mausoleums, empty homes, empty cars. The news will do their best. They'll give you this fake news story talking about committees coming together of the, these nitwits talking about invasion and the, and the people have come. These UFOs have come and snatched them off the earth. New Agers have been jabbering about that nonsense for decades now. I'm telling you, they're talking about things like Psychologists will call it mass hysteria. Phone lines will be jammed. People trying to get in touch with their loved ones. But AT&T lines don't reach this far because the greatest prayer meeting that the world has ever known will happen the day after the rapture. The day after is where they'll come and they'll begin to pray. Fear begins to grip their heart. But it's over. God's children have already gone home. The Holy Spirit has already left because the Holy Spirit is not a building with brick and mortar. It's you and I that represent the embodiment of our Lord Jesus. The churches will be packed front to back with people saying the Lord has come and we're lost. Just like the pastor said he, said he was going to come and now he's came and we're left behind to go through the hell of the tribulations. You say, well... I don't understand what you're trying to say. I'm just telling you this. This earth-shattering event that's coming next is called the rapture of the church. It's the literal catching away, the, the catching up of God's children to go home in the twinkling of an eye. I say that to you because you need to pray up. You need to pack up. You need to look up. We're going up in the twinkling of an eye. 
The Bible says something interesting. They'll come from the north, the south, the east, and west. And all the numbers of them shall be ten thousands upon thousands. That's the Bible's way, ladies and gentlemen, of saying numbers without limit. It's an innumerable host. The Bible says that God wipes away every tear from the eye. There'll be no more parting there. No more suffering there. We'll no, have, no longer have to worry about what side of the political aisle you're on. And we're living in a time where, where everything is meant to divide us and separate us and cause us to be angry over one another because of political divides, ethnic divides, nonsense divides, church divides. And now we're together. God's children united together. Whole Home and home forever. No more suffering. No more pain. No more parting. No more sorrow. I'm telling you that because for the former things pass away. And God says, I've done a new thing. I've done a new thing. There's no disease. There's no depression. There's no more suffering. There's no more cancer. There's no more heart trouble. There's no more because the great physician has come to take his bride home. And listen. Eventually, you're going to, when you get to heaven, and this is what many Christians don't realize, you're saved by grace through faith, and you're not saved by works. But ladies and gentlemen, you're saved to do the work of the gospel. Many Christians are waiting for somebody else to do the work, and God said, when are you going to get busy to do what I called you to do? And I say that because when you get to heaven, you're going to receive a robe of righteousness, which the Bible calls the righteous working and acts of the saints. And what you do here determines what type of robe and crown you get up there. The Bible tells us we're going to receive one of five different crowns. The crown of life, the victor's crown, the elder's crown, the martyr's crown, and the soul winner's crown. You'll be labeled to go in heaven and look at what somebody did and how well they did it. That's why I always encourage our church here. And that's why I keep building other churches because I'm trying to do my best to get people ready ready for the Son of God to come, ready to take their eyes off their own crisis and their own issues and their own problems and their own insecurities and get their eye off of their mirror and get their eye on the lost where Jesus said, it's plentiful, but my workers are not. Why? Because you're living in your own parable and you're not understanding God's doing a parallel thing and he's saying, I want you to look out and I want you to see the fig tree bloom and I want you to understand the season has changed, the world has changed, war has come, enemies have come, the dividing has come and what you need to do as believers, you need to be the answer to a world suffering problem. I say that because... It's going to be amazing when the church gets raptured and all hell breaks loose. Some of you think all hell is broken loose. It hasn't yet because you're here and I'm here. And we're here to bring the difference and be the difference maker. This is important to know because you'll be able to look in heaven at a person and what they did and how well they did it. I say that because these are the thoughts of the bride that's concerning his children. Do you hear what I hear? Many of you don't because you don't have an understanding of the times in which we're living in. Yeah, yeah. But if you understand the times in which we're living in, if you listen closely, you can hear wedding music. The orchestra of heaven is beginning to play. Here comes the bride. If you hear it, you can hear the footsteps of Messiah shuffling through the clouds of glory, preparing to come for his bride. We're getting ready. We're getting ready. We're getting ready. But the question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And is your family ready? Are you ready to see the king? Are you ready to take your family and tell them about the king, your co-worker, your neighbor? The Bible says, how will we escape if we neglect such great a salvation? How will we escape the things that are not coming, the things that are here? They're here. So let me ask you this question this morning. I'll slow it down so you can really capture what I'm trying to communicate to you today because I really want you to get this. Now, let me ask you a question. If you don't believe in the rapture as described in the Bible, where people literally rise to meet the Lord into the air, how are you going to know the real Jesus when he gets here? How are you going to know? Anyone can stand on the Mount of Olives and say, I'm the real Jesus. Anyone can make for himself a beautiful white robe. Anyone can claim he's a descendant of King David. Anyone can have him follow, his followers crown him the king of the new Israel uh, and put him on the, on, the, on the mountain there in Jerusalem. Anyone can have now surgically implanted scars on their hands and feet. My gosh, they implant everything else. 
I saw a dude, and he had implanted calves. His calves were riding on ostrich sticks. So he said, I'm going to be big up top. I want you to implant calf muscles. I'm like, have we gotten that ridiculous? We're implanting calf muscles. What's next? My mind didn't even want to go there. But my point is anyone can have for themselves surgically implanted scars on their hands and feet. This is not the real Jesus. He's a fraud. He's an imposter. God knew at the beginning that imposters and frauds would come and claim to be Christ. And deceiving, the Bible says, if it were so, the very elect would be deceived. So Jesus said, if anyone shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, lo, there is Christ, believe them not. That's what Jesus said. You recently hear these things that come and you say, well, Jesus is on the earth. Jesus is here. No, we're here. And we represent the Lord Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is not here. He sits by the right hand of God the Father with power and great glory. The next time someone tells you they've seen Jesus face to face, you tell them you've had too many onions on your hamburger. You have not seen him. He is not here. He is at the right hand of God the Father. How do you respond to those people? You just pray for them and love them. So when I, when I say this, because how did Jesus know this in the beginning and tell us that all these false pretenders would come? He knew that they would come saying he's the Christ. He knew. So he scripturally installed a fail-safe system. Listen closely. That was so staggering. It was so supernatural. It was so earth-shattering that not even Satan nor his imps can imitate what Jesus is going to do, the magnificent of what I'm talking about. This fail-safe method is called the rapture. Satan has always tried to emutate, emulate what Christ has done. That's why it's what I call pigeon religion. Pigeon religion looks like the dove, sounds like the dove, acts like the dove, but pigeons are filthy, nasty, and dirty. We have a pigeon problem at our church in Las Vegas, and you know what I found out? I was devastated when I found out this, Brother Pablo. You get a $1,000 fine for shooting pigeons. I'm like, how much money I got? Because I want to shoot these filthy, filthy flying devils. These are the most grossest things you will ever encounter. They're not a dove. They're a pigeon. Pigeons mate with any other pigeon. Pigeon gone wow. Dove have one mate for life. Pigeons are loud. They're noisy. Doves can't stand noise. And Jesus knew that all these pretenders would come. And the Old Testament, because whatever Christ has done, the enemy tries to emulate. He's never originated anything. He's copied everything. So when you understand that, that's what the enemy does. So instead of having the significant and the beauty of the dove, people get the pigeon. And the pigeon jumps from church to church. They become church bunnies. Pigeons don't have honor. They don't have integrity. They don't have loyalty. Pigeons only do what's best for the filthiness of the pigeon. But doves are different. Doves are different. This system that I'm talking about is an important because in the Old Testament, I'm talking about emulating what Jesus has done. You know the story. When Moses walked in to face Pharaoh, many of you know that story. Moses threw down his stick and it became a serpent. Remember that in the Bible? It's amazing. It's supernatural stuff. So what did Pharaoh do? He called in his warlocks, Jannies and Jambres. Sounds like a Ben and Jerry ice cream flavor. <laughs> Jannies and Jambres, he calls them out. Moses' stick turned into a serpent. They do the same thing, turns into two. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if you are turning a stick into a serpent, that's heavyweight supernatural stuff. You're losing me. That's beyond my pay grade. You're involved in that type of stuff. I'm backing out. I'm like, I'm not all for this. This is crazy. But what had happened? Moses' snake devoured the other two snakes to show the supremacy of the word and the power of Almighty God. I'm telling you that because you need to know Satan always emulates. In the New Testament, the Antichrist emutate, emutate. Blah, blah, blah. Let me speak in tongues. The, the Antichrist will imitate Jesus Christ. 
In Revelation chapter 6, the Antichrist rides out on a white horse, and you see this happening. Why? Because in Revelation 19, Christ returns the second coming on the right horse. The second coming is when? When he comes to the Kidron Valley. He puts his foot through the Kidron Valley. He walks through that Kidron Valley. He goes to the Temple Mount. He sets upon the throne of his father David, and of that kingdom, there's no end. That's the second return. What I'm talking about is the rapture, where he catches us away in the clouds. The second return, he comes back on a white horse. We're followed with him by the armies which are in heaven. The Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints were with the Lord. And we see this happening and we know the enemy tries to emulate it. The Antichrist does what Jesus is going to do. He rides out on a white horse and he tries to do it. Christ dies and rode victoriously from the dead. So the Antichrist is going to be shot in the head. The Bible says he will miraculously cover. He always Immutates the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Satan is always trying to do that. He always, always has done it. And he will imitate what God has done. When Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave, that's what the rapture is all about. That's why I'm trying to teach you this today. Because many people don't, don't even believe in the rapture, they don't understand it because they don't believe in it. That's why I'm trying to teach you this. Because the rapture is something significant, greater, I believe, than even a catching us away to escape what's coming. But the rapture is Christ's total celebration over death, over hell, and over the grave. The rapture is the ultimate humiliation of Satan. That's why Satan hates the teaching of the rapture. They hate, he hates it. Why? Because I'll know it's the real Jesus. Not by what I read in the newspaper or, or on media. Not by what some person tells me. I'll know it's the real Jesus. Not by what some theologian has tried to argue in the Ivy Leagues of America. I, I'll, not know it's the, I'll know it's the real Jesus. Not by some charismatic personality standing on the Mount of Olives with a bed sheet on saying he's the king of the new Jerusalem. That's not how I'll know. I'll know it's the real Jesus when my body sails through the air in the twinkling of an eye at a million miles a second. And I rise past the Milky Way, past Mars, past Saturn, into the pearly gates straight into the arms of God. I'll know it's the Son of God when I stand before Him, a brand new disease-proof body, a never-dying body, a brand new being created in the image and likeness of God. I'll know it's the real Jesus when I got that beautiful long head of hair, beautiful like a lion's mane. I know it's Him. You think this is a glorified body? Not hardly. Those who tack this, they say, well, the rapture is nothing more than a myth. It's allegorical. It's, it's not true. You hear this by a lot of people. They, they attack things they don't know, yeah, right. what they don't understand. Now you have social media. You'll get some person on there who couldn't, who couldn't find John 3.16 with a C&I dog. And they're on there telling you, there'll be no rapture. This is why I left the church. This is why. Uh, and people are like, yeah, I left the church too. Hee, hee, hee. Emoji fire. They attack the rapture teaching because they say it's not literal, that it's allegorical, meaning it's a myth. Yes. This heresy started in the second century, but the Bible is not a myth. It's the absolute inerrant word of God. Right. If the Bible is a myth, then hey, can we, do, can we be myth taken? Oh. Let's just be myth taken. Let's be mythified. And let's be a congregation that is the most mithrable. If this is a myth, what I hold here is the absolute truth of what God has said from cover to cover. Jesus is literally born of a virgin in Bethlehem's manger. He literally healed people. He literally had a miracle ministry. He literally died on a cross. He was literally buried in a borrowed grave. He literally rose from the dead on the third day, just like he said he would. He literally sits by the right hand of God the Father. He's literally going to come back to this earth in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Every knee is literally going to bow. Every tongue is literally going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm literally going to rise to meet the Lord in the air. I'm literally going to walk on the streets of gold. I'm literally going to have a crown of righteousness. I'm literally going to live forever and forever with the son of the living God. 
You know, you say, well, the, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Do you know the word Bible's not in the Bible? Shocking. <laughs> Bible's not in the Bible either. The word Trinity is not in the Bible either. But over and over, you hear God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. These are important to know because critics of the rapture teaching, you're just teaching escapism. There's no more escapism talking about the rapture than escapism of salvation accepting Christ to escape hell. I'm glad you tell you that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Is he the Lord of your life? The Bible tells us to watch, therefore, and pray that we be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming upon the earth. How will we escape if we neglect such great a salvation? Friends, the answer is there is no escape outside redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can be moral and church member, but lost and without God. If you, not have, if you have not accepted Jesus, it's as simple as acceptance so you can go. So you can go this way and you can go spread the light this way. Because you can't give what you don't have. So I've, I'll close out. I'm going to run these quickly for the sake of time. But I want you to know that this message today for you is for you to have this understanding. That we're in a parable, a parallel time. That the next prophetic event that happens is the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is not escapism for us to live like we want to live because the Lord is coming. So let's just, no, no. It's to, it's to do everything, prepare like he's not going to return. But you're so ready that if he returns before I finish this sermon, you're ready to meet your maker. Some of you in the sound of my voice aren't ready to meet your maker. You're not right with God. And if you were to die and breathe your last breath in the next 60 seconds, you don't know if you'll meet the son of God. And I share this with you because these are the signs that causes the church to leave. One of these signs is so evident right now that it's maddening that people don't see that this book, if you open it every day, you find the news in this book in parallel coming to light each and every day. The first sign is the increase of knowledge. The Bible says in the book of Daniel that Daniel said, shut up the words and seal them in the book until the time of the end. Hear the words, until the time of the end. And when men shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be greatly increased. That last translation of knowledge is explosion. Until there is a knowledge explosion. Our generation, and I am in a generation like you that has experienced the knowledge explosion. From the Garden of Eden to the 1900s, there was no knowledge explosion. Increase of knowledge has greatly, greatly increased and supernaturally sped up. Time is speeding up. Things are speeding up. And the church is asleep. Ah, I'm asleep. I'm just going to go along to get along. Bless my four and no more. Maybe my name's Jimmy. I'll take all you give me. But now we're in this time, and I'm trying to establish in the church, our church, your gifts, your talents. God's calling you to account. Not tomorrow, today. This is a knowledge explosion. A knowledge explosion has happened. Think about this for a moment. This is an amazing thought when you think about it. In, the, in those times, in the Garden of Eden, all the way through David and Julius Caesar, they rode on horseback, and transportation was very minimal. And then came what? The automobile. Then the jet age. Then supersonic flight. You can fly from New York to Paris in under four hours. Unbelievable. From the Garden of Eden to the 1900s, you used torches for light. That light then became a little brighter and a little brighter. Then through steel, that became delicate surgery now. They do such traumatic things. They're overwhelming. We are the generation of the knowledge explosion. From the Garden of Eden to the 1900s, communication was used with smoke signals, lighting lanterns, brightly brass shields reflecting to each other. Now we have so much interaction, so much information. It's overwhelming to us. Not to count on AI. AI has just been released upon the world, and we don't know the results of AI yet. AI, we've been told, I just read this, that it needs 300 times the power to push AI. 
So now the crazy lunatics that said, no nuclear power. We can't have nuclear power. Guess what they're screaming? We need nuclear power. We need nuclear power. We need to get eight. We need to get Three Mile Island back up and running. We need to get nuclear. It's safe and effective now. Why? Because they want control of this new knowledge explosion. It's called AI, artificial intelligence. You think fake news, misinformation, disinformation upon a green screen was something impressive? Wait until AI gets released. The knowledge explosion is staggering. And we're here. It's not coming. We are here. I shared that with you today because all of us can be, we're like right now, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, we're overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed with political. We're overwhelmed with family. We're overwhelmed. It's like too much, too much, too much. And we're overwhelmed. And we need to step back. We need to take a deep breath. And we need to look at our landscape. And look at the season we're in and understand who we are and whose we are. That's right. All of this knowledge Amen. has not improved our society. Amen. If you educate man, they'll say it produces a utopia. It hasn't done it. October 7th, we never thought we'd see this in our lifetimes, but anti-Semitism and a new Holocaust has already reared its ugly head. It's not happening in this area or that area. It's happening in our highest levels of education across America. Why? Because that same devil that tried to take them out when they were coming out of Egypt and Amalek, that same devil explores the new horizons of an educated society today because education without God only produces intellectual barbarians. Education without God only produces intellectual barbarians. Hitler's Nazis, many of them had PhDs, but watch them as they throw Jewish children into the ovens of Auschwitz. You say, well, that can never happen again. You're wrong. It's already on the precipice of happening now. It happened October 7th. Israel was at peace, and then they declared war on them. And now Israel is being attacked on seven fronts by Iran itself now with the most weapons in human history that has been launched in the world history. And we are saying, we don't know what to do. I'm telling you what to do. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for the coming of the Lord. But that's the first thing. This is the second one that we are the generation to see the coming of the Lord. And it's nuclear warfare. You hear President Trump talking if you're listening to what he's saying as he's running to be a new president here coming November 5th, he's talking about the danger of pushing other nations to war. Whether they're doing it through diplomatic channels or direct verbal through media, he's warning the world that nuclear war is imminent, that there's a danger. Why do I say that to you? Not to be political. But to understand, they're briefed every single morning. Yeah. They get debriefed on things that are happening. And I think personally, he's sending out a signal to the world. We're here. We're here. And we need to cool it back. Because the sign of the terminal generation is nuclear warfare. Before the birth of nuclear warfare, folks, there was a passage in Scripture that ministers way before my time could not reveal. And it was found in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. And it says this, the plague the Lord shed shall so send on those who come in a fight against Jerusalem. This is what he says. That in the midst, their flesh shall cur, 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 uh, cur, come away, consume away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in the holes of their tongue and shall melt in their mouth. That is a prophet called Zechariah that 4,000 years ago described exactly the most powerful H-bomb that produces heat of 150 million degrees Fahrenheit in one million of a second. Those ballistic missiles, by the way, all they needed was a nuclear tip. And they would have devastated everywhere, even if they were shot out in the air. Those rockets, over 200 of them, were not meant to take a, a city out. They were to take Israel out. Yeah. 
Why does that matter to you and I? Because when Israel's at war, the world's at war. When Israel's at war, the church is at war. The sands of the sea, the stars of the heaven, that seed, it's important to know that. This is another sign, and it's what I call the mega sign. Everybody say mega sign. It's the mega sign. I know this is a lot of information, and some of you are like, I'm already on tilt, Joey. Please stop. No. <laughs> this is the rebirth of Israel. The rebirth of Israel is what I would call, guys, you could come. We can begin to play. Team, hold tight, but guys, you could come and play. The rebirth of Israel. In May of 1948, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 66, can a nation shall be born in a day. May 15th, that was a reality. The disciples said to Jesus, listen to this. When are you coming back? And what are the signs of your coming back? And Jesus said, look at the parable. Huh. The parable is a parallel. Look at the parable of the fig tree Israel. When you see the branches begin to bloom again, know that that tree is coming back to life again. You know my coming is at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation will not pass until all be fulfilled. In 1967, Jerusalem was united under Jewish people, and that generation is 40 years. That's a Jewish generation. That is a 40-year turn that took us to 2007. In other words, I take it from 67 to 2007. That's a Jewish generation, 40 years. We've already passed the point. In other words, I'll call it what I would think of it. We're already gracing it. We're already here in the scope of the timeline. The parallel. It's a linear timeline if you look at it. And most of us are looking at it because... We can't see this timeline because we're in this one. We're focused on this one. We're not seeing fully what's happening because we've never taken time for ourselves to know what this scripture and this book has to say about it. And that's why you're here today, so you can know, so you can leave here today assured, faith-filled, knowing that God's got your back and that everything's going to be all right. It's a mega sign. Another sign of a generation that's terminal to see the coming of the Lord is scoffers. Scoffers are what the apostle Peter said, knowing this, there shall come in the last days scoffers saying, where is the sign of his coming? The very fact that people don't believe is the fact he's on his way. When people say, well, I don't believe, I'm like as some type of intellectual accomplishment. Well, okay. Okay. I don't believe you look like that, but you do. I say this interesting one that it's really gone. Most theologians don't look at this one, but they don't, they don't bring this one in. But I brought this in for you because I think you're a very astute pupil. I think you're very smart. What are you hearing about now? Russia, 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 Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine. Ah, ah. You're hearing all the, you're, you're, because the axis is of evil, Ezekiel 30, 38, 30, it's all aligning up. But. A prophetic sign, what many Christians don't know, was the gathering of the Russian Jews back home. You say, well, didn't that happen in 48? No, no, no. We, you, you, you had a war going on. And now, because of what's happened in our world, you have the gathering of the Russian Jews into Israel. That happened in the 1970s, and it's happening today. You say, well, where is this found in Scripture that, that Russian Jews are coming home? And this is a a massive amount of people that are doing this, not just a few. This is massive. Jeremiah 23, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they'll no longer say, Blessed is the Lord that brought them out of Egypt. That's Exodus 1. But they'll say, Blessed is the Lord that brought them out of the north country. That would be Russia. Because directly north of Israel is Russia. That they may dwell in the land and come home. You're seeing it. That's why the... The accesses of evil are all coming together. That's a sign, another sign, that when Jerusalem was captured back under Israeli control. You say, well, when did that happen last? Did they have it like in the 20s, 30s? When did they have it? 70 AD. When the Romans came in and when Jesus said, this temple, every stone will be turned upon the other. They said, well, how can this happen? Well, it happened in 70 AD. They thought gold was between those stones. 
And so the Romans took that temple and they turned it over. When you go to Israel today in Jerusalem, it's a magnificent sight. You can see some of those cornerstones turned over still as they were turned in the first century. And in 70 AD, there was a great diaspora. It means a dispersal. And the Jews were spread abroad across the world. And that great diaspora lasted until when? 1967. 1967, from 70 AD to 1967, they came back home. And Luke 21, 24, Jesus said, Jerusalem shall be trotted down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentile be fulfilled. Jerusalem is no longer under the Gentile non-Jewish control. Again, listen to Psalms 102, verse 16. When the Lord shall build up Zion, that means Jerusalem, he shall appear in all of his glory. God gets emotional about Jerusalem. King David said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that they may prosper that loves thee. From this moment forward, for the rest of our lives. Jerusalem is the center of the universe. I have so many more, and I just feel like you're like, oh, I don't care. Do you care? Do you guys care? Jennifer, do they care? Can we thumb this up or down? Should I wrap this up? What are we doing? They're kind of just like looking at me like, eh, I don't know. No, I'm going to give you the, the, the you're going to be the guillotine. I got five more minutes. Should I wrap it up or give them a few more? Thumb it up if I should keep going or thumb it down means get out. Jennifer thumbs it up. Sorry. <laughs> Let me give you a couple more. Signs that we're a terminal generation. It's the invention of the internet. In Revelation, there's an interesting passage of scripture that two witnesses, they die. The Antichrist kills them. Those witnesses, I believe, are Elijah and Enoch. Why Elijah and Enoch? Because they're the only two since the dawn of creation that hasn't died. They both were taken away and did not experience death. The Bible says it's appointed for man once to die and after death, the judgment. Yeah. So these two witnesses, Elijah and Enoch, will gather the, the people that have been left behind to come to know the Lord. And they will be performing mighty miracles in Jerusalem. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 9 and 10, that these witnesses will be standing in the streets of Jerusalem and be killed by the Antichrist. And the Bible says something interesting out of Revelation. Now, remember, this is not written 20 years ago. This was written thousands of years ago. And the Bible says the world will be so thrilled that they'll give gifts because the Antichrist crowd hates the two men of God. But the Bible says something interesting. It just doesn't leave it open like that. It says, they shall see them within the hour. Back in the day, that was impossible. The 1900s before the knowledge explosion, impossible. In the 1950s, 60s, even 70s, impossible. But now you can see real-time events happening right now from Sierra Leone, Africa to Jerusalem. You can watch it right now because of satellite, because of internet, because of instant access society. We are this generation. It's the generation of deception. Yeah. And that's another one. Yeah. The Bible says, take heed that no man deceives you. Right. Our generation, friends, is a generation of deception. People are being deceived right now. This political candidate's good. This one's bad. You make the pick of your lesser poison. But you have to pick in society and in life with your relationships with every single day holy spirit is this being deceiving to me is there deception among me is what's going on real fake and different what is this because jesus said in the last days take heed that no man deceive you yeah. our generation is now a generation of deception a little boy can be a little girl that's deception Reproductive health, deception. It's deception. It's murder in the first degree. It's not deception. It's a modern day Holocaust. New age is deception. Satanism is deception. Religion is deception. Friends, you could be religious and lost. You can profess Christ but not possess Christ. You can be under the water and not be under the blood. You can be artificial but not actual. 
there's another, can I thumb me up if I got two more minutes? She's like, ah, she's getting wavy. She's like, ah, you better chill. Let me give you two more. And this is a controversial one, so, hey, you believe what you believe. But I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to add this to this, my own opinion now, so I'm going to add it to it, so scripturally take it, my own opinion, just salt it up. Salt it up. Scripture, salt is a rock. My opinion, a little salt. A little salt on it. Famines, earthquakes, and pestilence. The sign of his coming. The signs of his coming. In Revelation chapter 6, the rider of the black horse is death. And with the pair of balances in his hands, he says, a measure of wheat for a penny. The fact is there is a time it's happening that everything is coming is shaking. Now, whether you look at this as I do, on a lot of occasions, it's a man-made pestilence. It's still pestilence. Man-made issues with the climate and with what's happening. It's still shaking it up because people are evil. And what you have to understand, whether the thing is created, this is my salt now on this scripture, whether that thing is created organically by God Almighty because of the signs we're living or the evil of men has, has put propensity to do what is evil because the enemy is, is working through them to bring forth it. God will use all of it because he said in his word in these days, because I think a lot of it is man-made destruction that still brings the scripture to pass. Pestilence a disease that cannot be cured. Let me give you an illustration. They produce them in labs. How is that good? Time you got to wear arm stuff on you. It's not good. Pestilence, disease that cannot be cured. We're, we're living in this time. So you have to look at this thing and go, what's really happening? The Lord's return is happening. That's what it is. God is saying, you need my help. You need my help. Earthquakes in diverse places. California is awaiting the big one. What we're seeing in North Carolina, they've never had floods like that before. They've never had floods like that before. Only 2% of them had flood insurance because there are no floods there in the Appalachian Mountains. It's never happened before. I believe it's because man makes it happen. And when man makes it happen, it brings the scripture to fulfill, just like if God takes it and lets it happen. And you say, well, that sounds like a conspiracy theory. Well, let's just go down the rabbit hole. Because this is a sign. A great earthquake, Revelation 16, verse 18, that such the world has never seen. The islands of the seas began to disappear. The mountains were no more found. That's what the book says is coming. And the final one, and I will close, Jennifer, so thumb that down. Just say, go. The tenth and final sign is the days of Noah. So was it in the days of Noah. So shall it be in thy coming of the Son of Man. No man knoweth the day or the hour of Christ's coming, but we know it's very near. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be as in the days of Noah. That's how it's going to be when I return. The parable of that fig tree and all the trees. The season has changed. We're not going back to the way it used to be. We're not going back to the way it used to be, whether good, bad, or indifferent. God told Noah, build an ark. Noah built the ark. I have a song by Johnny Cash that I think all of you would enjoy. I, I just put, downloaded it on my playlist. You can look it up. It's called He'll Be a Friend. It's about Noah building the ark. Anyway, God told Noah to build the ark. Noah built the ark. God put the animals on the ark. And then God put Noah and his family on the ark. Notice the connection. God put them on the ark. 
God put them on the ark. And then it says, God closed the door. When you're on the ark with the animals, with your family, and God has shut the door, you know the flood is coming. It's very near. Noah didn't know the exact hour the flood would come, but he knew it was near. All of this message today, and it is a lot, and I, I'm serious. I, I know that you were receiving it. And I was joking with you. This is a lot. This is like, this is like. Bible theological stuff that that gives you a a degree. I understand that. You're welcome. But Noah didn't know the exact hour, but he knew the flood was coming. Jesus said to us, and the reason why I just was working on this message all week, I'm like, maybe I'll give it to a part. Maybe I'll give some of it. And I just felt, no, give them the kitchen. Say, give them everything. Leave them with this. Because one of it will make sense to you, one is going to make sense to you, one's going to free you up, one's going to encourage you, and one should scare the hell out of you. Just scare the hell right out of you. Or you're like, I'm not going to live myself anymore, I'm going to live for the Lord. Jesus said, when you see these ten signs, you're that generation. He said, lift up your head and rejoice your redemption is near. Christ is coming with all of his power and all of his glory. Let's get ready for it. Let's stand.